whatever happened during Reconstruction, and then up through the Jim Crow era, anything and everything that had to deal with the relationships between the blacks and the whites just went underground. There's been a really good job of whitewashing, a very awkward discussion. It's a hugely awkward discussion. So before I begin the video, I wanted to remind everybody uh, this information, well, this book that we've gone over, uh, something Benjamin Franklin said that we need to really uh, pay attention to, right? So uh, the book is called Obser Observations Concerning the Increase of Mankind, Peopling of Countries um, by Benjamin Franklin. All right, Benjamin Franklin wrote this, right? This is from 1755, and we're on page 10 of this book. And this is what Benjamin Franklin says, says point 24, which is making observations, right? He's given, which leads me to add one remark. He says that the number of purely white people in the world is proportionally very small. It's very small. You're the minority. All Africa is black or tawny. Asia, chiefly tawny. All right, tawny, a darker complexion, right? Not, not white. America, exclusive of the newcomers, holy soul. All right, what is that saying? America is what? Black or tawny. Holy soul. Except the new people, the newcomers. Meaning that the aboriginals that were already there is holy what? Black or tawny. All right, Benjamin Franklin, and you know. And in Europe, the Spaniards, Italians, French, Russians, Swedes are generally of what we call swarthy complexion. Swarthy. All right, just in case you don't know what Swarthy is, and just a quick reminder, we're here in the American Dictionary of the English Language. All right, this is actually Webster's uh, 1828 uh, Dictionary. All right, I got the official PDF. We're going to go all the way to the word uh, Swarthy. All right, and right here it says Swart, right? Almost sounds like Stuart. Swart, Stuart, Swart, Stuart. Is that what they get? Stuart, did it mean black or dark? What is Swart? It says being of dark hue, moderately black, tawny, swart. All right. Down here it says swart to make tawny or brown. Swart in apparition. <laughs> Swartly. All right. Duskly with a tawny hue. It says swartness, tawniness, a dusky or dark complexion. Dark complexion, all right? Dark complexion, swarty. Being of a dark hue or dusky complexion. Tawny. In warm climates, the complexion of men is universally what? Swarthy or what? Black in warm climates. Is there only warm climates in Africa? No, we have warm climates all over the world, right? The Moors, Spaniards, and Italians are more swarthy than the French, Germans, and English. This says their swarthy hosts would darken all our plains. Swarthy. All right, black, as the Swarthy African says, right? As the Swarthy African. So the African is Swarthy, right? Swarthy is a tawny color. Swartish, somewhat dark or tawny. Swarthy, Swarthy, tawny. All right? So you get the picture, right? Swarthy, so an African is Swarthy, right? Black, right? So again, he said, Benjamin Franklin, that in Europe, the Spaniards, Italians, French, Russians, Russians, French, Italians, Spaniards, and Swedes are generally of what we call a swarthy complexion, black complexion, as are the Germans. So is the Germans. Germans. So is the Germans. Swarthy complexion. Swarthy complexion. Germans. So is the Germans. Swarthy complexion. All right, so now I want to read uh, this article uh, to you guys. Um, and it's from the Louisiana History, uh, the Journal of the Louisiana Historical Association, volume 40, number two. This is from spring 1999. You can find this article on pages 133 to 153. It's about 21 pages. It says here, and this is the name of the uh, article, Sally Muller, The White Slave, by Carol Wilson. It says here, a white skin is no security whatsoever. I should no more dare to send white children out to play alone, especially at night, than I should dare send them into a forest of tigers and hyenas. Parker Pillsbury to William Lord Garrison, 1853. One day in the spring of 1843, Mrs. Carl Roof, a German immigrant, went into a cafe on Levy Street in New Orleans. The slave who served the 
her looked familiar. And eventually, Madame Carl, as she was known, realized that the woman was one of her compatriots, Salome Muller. The two had last seen each other more than two decades earlier, when both arrived in the city with several hundred other Germans. All right. So remember, these Palatines, thousands of them coming over here, hundreds of them. I don't know if these are specifically Palatines, but we know a lot of Germans. They were all indentured servants. A lot of these Germans were swarthy. You know, we got the references in the, uh, the newspaper ads and, and, and a lot of different descriptions. And, and so we're talking about indentured servants here that they're talking about they came together in a ship full of indentured servants. And they remember, the lady remembered the, the girl she's talking about. Again, they came earlier, both arrived in the city with several hundred other Germans. Muller's mother and infant brother had not survived the voyage. You hear that? So the lady, the girl that she's seen, she knows the story of her mother dying on the voyage, on the way over here through the middle passage. Her mom died in the middle passage, coming over here, crossing the Atlantic on a ship. Her and her little brother, her mom and her little brother died. All right, and her father and older brother died soon after arrival. Her whole family just died. That was happening massively with these indentured servants. Salome and her sister, Dorothea, both under age of six, had never been seen or heard from again. So these two children were orphaned and they were Germans. They came in that shipload. The lady remembers, I guess the lady might be a little older, right? But she remembers who these girls are or the, or the girl that she's talking about. And she remembers they had just disappeared. So now she runs into her, I guess, maybe a little older. It says, Madame Carl questioned the slave who displayed no recollection of her pre previous life. So she was a slave. We're talking about Germans, right? She explained that she was the property of Louis Belmonte, owner of the cafe. Madame Carl then took Muller to the home of Eve and Francis Schruber, who had traveled on the same voyage. Mrs. Schruber was Muller's cousin and godmother. The Schrubers also positively identified her as the missing girl, Salome, known as Sally. With their help, she sued in court for her freedom, first losing then winning on appeal to the Louisiana State Supreme Court. You hear this? All right, so they found this uh, German uh, person that was that came in probably as indentured servants with them, and now she was as a slave owned by this person in Louisiana, and she sued and got her freedom. It says Muller's story was known to 19th century Louisianans. So they knew this, but they never told anybody. And I didn't know about this. In 1889, popular author George Washington Cable published Strange True Stories of Louisiana. It contained a piece entitled Salome Muller, the White Slave, about a German girl who came to Louisiana as a child with her family and after being orphaned, found herself enslaved. Later, as an adult, she successfully sued in court to regain her freedom. The same year, a German scholar at Tulane University, J. Hanno Taylor, also published an account of the Muller case in a pamphlet on the history of Germans in Louisiana. But since then, the fascinating case has fallen into obscurity. All right. They wanted to put this under the ta uh, under the rug, right? Hide this. How could a white person become enslaved in the antebellum United States in a society that clearly equated slave status with black skin? This is very important right here. So I hope we dodge in the hijack. Now we are to assume, based on what this article is saying, that this German lady is white, right? We are to assume that, all right? We are to assume we don't know. We don't have a picture of her. We don't know a description of her complexion at a primary source. From Unless there exists, we got to find it, right? I have to dig into that. Just wanted to read this to you. These are real stories. So this is supposedly a white person because she's German. All right, so let's go even with the white thing, right? Now we know there's white slaves, right? She was a white slave. This is a real story. So if you want to believe she was white, she's we're talking about a white slave then, right? But for me, it's questionable. To me, it's questionable, and I would want to verify what she really looked like, all right? Because I know that a lot of times they're just saying white because they were Europeans, or in this case, German, but she might have been white. So how could a German immigrant be mistaken for an African-American? Gosh, the hijack. See, so they're throwing the whole African thing there. So we know there's hijack in these authors, you know, 
uh, writing. Although certainly not common, Mueller's experience was not unique. Oh, it's not just her. Uh uh-uh. uh. And there's a source for that. See, number five the enslavement of a white person reveals that American ideas about slavery and race were not nearly as clear cut as many whites believed. <laughs> And not just whites, so-called Negroes too, or people of color. They also believe the whole Kunta Quinta thing. They still believe they're coming out of Africa. Do your genealogy. I don't know. Do it case by case. I'm not going to generalize. But just just do your genealogy, and then you will know. In 1817, the Mullers left their home in the town of Lagenschultzbach, Wittenberg, part of a large migration of southern Germans during the aftermath of the Napoleonic Wars, when a reactionary government had instituted press censorship and harassment of intellectuals. Probably more important for the masses, however, was the local economic crisis. Württemberg, like other nearby states, had a large population to support on land poorly suited to agriculture. In 1817, the region experienced one of the most devastating family famines in its history. That year alone, over 16,000 people left Wittenberg. 16,000 Germans. Where did all these people end up? And how did they make it to America? The Mueller's paid full passage to Philadelphia, planning to move west of the city into the farm country inhabited by many of their countrymen. Though some of their Wittenberg neighbors were farmers, members of the Mueller family were skilled artisans. Sally's father, Danny, was a shoemaker, his brother, Henry, a lock maker. Still, they had been negatively affected by the poor agricultural economy. And in April, they set out with a large party of friends and relatives for Amsterdam. Arriving in August, laden with all their wor- worldly uh, possessions, they were sent to Den Helder, the deep water port of the North Sea. Here they remained, along with nearly 900 other anxious passengers aboard the Rudolph 900, a huge Russian ship, and several smaller ships for three to four months. They were on this ship for three to four months. Winter was growing near, food supplies were dwindling, and eventually the passengers discovered that they had been swindled. The agent to whom they had paid their passage to the United States had absconded with their money. So all of a sudden they don't have money. So they had a story of them having money, being wealthy. They were just, mm, I don't I don't buy all that. I got to dig into all that. These sound like people who were poor from the beginning. This put the Mueller's, like their relatives and neighbors, in a precarious position. Now they're poor. While not completely impoverished, they had spent their savings booking passage to the United States, traveling to Amsterdam and buying provisions for the journey. Now those provisions were nearly exhausted. Some of the emigrants resorted to begging in the streets. Eventually, the Dutch government intervened on their behalf and arranged for three ships to take them to the United States. They sailed in December of 1817. But the worst was not yet behind the Mullers. Incredibly, the unfortunate travelers faced further hardship. First, they were informed that their destination was no longer Philadelphia, but rather New Orleans. So the, all of a sudden, they changed their, their their destination, their port. They're like, wait, wait, you guys ain't going to Philly. You're actually going to New Orleans now. They're like, what? Over a thousand miles farther south, a more striking contrast would have been hard to imagine. So imagine they make it all the way to the East Coast, cross the Atlantic, the Middle Passage. Then they're like, oh, wait, we, we ain't here yet. We got to go a thousand miles further south. New Orleans in 1818 was less than two decades in American hands and seemed in many ways still a European outpost. Residents spoke French, street signs were in French or Spanish, and even the legal system, as Sally Muller was to discover years later, bore the stamp of the Roman Civil Code. Rather than English common law, Philadelphia, a large, sophisticated, prosperous port, had served previously as the nation's capital and still carried its distinctive Quaker influence. New Orleans was a backwater by contrast, but it had become a boomtown whose population had doubled in the decade after American acquisition. This population was diverse. Particularly surprising to European arrivals was the large number of black and mixed race residents. I wonder who these so-called black and mixed people are. Immigrants guidebooks warned travelers away from the city during the yellow fever season, extending from May to October. But the change in destination hardly constituted the worst of the immigrants' problems. The voyage itself was nightmarish. While about 900 persons had departed Holland, 
only about 300 arrived alive in New Orleans on March 6, 1818. Do you hear that? They went through a middle passage, right? Nine, about 900 people. And only 300 arrived. That 600 people died on the way. 600 people died through the Middle Passage. And we're not talking about, again, Africans here. I know you're like, wow, why does this dude keep saying that? Why is Cree Mill being so disrespectful, hating Africa? No, I'm just telling you real history here. Because the false history was pushed on us for years as a child. And that was you know traumatizing that's traumatizing man that's that's brainwashing and they didn't care teachers pushed it on me they still push it on us right now you're still arguing probably a lot of you like man he's fighting with that whole connection to africa well i'm sure there was some indentured servants coming out of africa but that's not the main theme here that's not the main story here that's that's very small numbers compared to the people they were actually using for their indentured servitude and their so-called slavery. Because as it says here, and you're talking about Kunta Quinte and all that hardship and, and cramped in ships and all that, we're talking about 900 people, only 300 people arriving. That means 600 people died in this middle passage, 600 Germans, 600 Germans. And a lot of those pe Germans were probably colored people too. But no, let's not care about them because they're German. We only care about if an African came over and died on the middle passage not if a black irish or a black english or a black german came oh, oh but you do care right you do you do care i know you care so you know we got to pay attention to all this don't leave out this story don't leave out these people they went through this they went through this some of these people might be your ancestors the journey to a new life brought death instead for many passengers including Dorothea Mueller, Sally's mother and her infant child. Remember, they died on the way. That was one of the 600, that was two of the 600 passengers named Daniel after his father. Like others who had died, they were buried at sea. They were thrown over, remember? Oh, they told us that happened in Roots. They told us that was only in Africans. No, they were. that was happening to Europeans and in their middle passage coming over here as indentured servants. The cause of these two deaths, as well as the other passengers, is not fully known, but starvation clearly played a part. Most of the food supplies had been used up while the ill-starred passengers waited at Den Helder. Those who were already ill or weakened, as Dorothea Mueller likely was, having given birth prior to the journey, were particularly vulnerable. At least the arriving Germans were not alone. Since the early 18th century, since the early 18th century, Louisiana had attracted German immigrants. And into Bellum, New Orleans. All right, we're talking about indentured servants, thousands and thousands of them in, New in Louisiana. Where are they? Where's their descendants? It's, you're saying it's all the white people that are there? I, I honestly, you know, I, I believe a lot of those are, are colored Germans, swarthy, and, you know, they call it so called Negro today. In Antebellum, New Orleans, they congregated in Lafayette, a suburb absorbed by the expanded metropolis lafayette became the fourth municipality in 1852 and in the faborn marigny the city's third municipality by 1839 the german community had its own german language newspaper and in 1847 a german society had organized to help immigrants but this was a little of little help to the muller family the surviving muller's father daniel and the, his three young children jacob dorothea and sally prepared to start a new life in what for them was a new world, but trouble still plagued them. Although Dutch government had paid full passage for the Mullers and their compatriots who had already paid passage once, at least one captain tried to get more, claiming that the immigrants were responsible for paying their way. So you now they're saying that these people had the Dutch government pay for them. Now let's look at this historically more accurately. So the Dutch government probably most likely pay their passage again as other governments and other companies were doing with everybody else because they would have to come here and work as indentured servants and pay that back remember that's the whole point of indentured servants they're leaving this out out of here they're leaving this out of here there's a whole thing this person's trying to sugarcoat her family's history because supposedly she's white and she might be white and even if she was white she's trying to sugarcoat 
that somehow she fell into slavery and it's just not supposed to happen. So Dutch, the Dutch government paid for their passage for no reason, right? Just because, hey, here, we're, we're cool. We feel so bad for you. Let me pay for the passage over there. We got all this extra money. We don't want it back. Don't worry. Don't pay us back. <laughs> so that's not reality, right? They had to, they were indentured servants. And that's why this captain was probably saying these immigrants were responsible for paying their way. Captain Grad Steer of the Jufer Johanna arranged to sell some of the Germans into indentured servitude through advertisements in a local newspaper. So now all of a sudden, he's just going to do it. I'm, like, I'm just going to sell you as an indentured servant. No, these people came in as indentured servants. That's how they came over here. That's how they paid their pass. That's what they promised. That was the contract they had even with whoever paid for them or the captain as redemptioneers or as indentured servants. Although more commonly associated with early colonial settlement of the eastern seaboard states, indentured servitude was still a source of labor in the 19th century. Again, was still a source of labor. Was still a source of labor. So when we're talking about since 1607 all the way until the 1800s, a source of labor was what indentured servitude, not Africa. The abolition of the international slave trade in 1808 had heightened interest in alternative methods of acquiring workers. The region of Germany from which the Müllers hailed, ravaged by war and famine, was a particular target of ship owners and their agents. You see, they were going to get these people over there because they knew they needed help. They knew these people were going through some bad stuff. They're like, yo, we can grab all those Germans over there. They'll, they'll definitely be willing to cross over here. The, those too poor to pay passage across the Atlantic could obtain transportation by selling their labor, usually for three to eight years, like I was explaining. These people didn't just come here and, and, and this Dutch company didn't just like, oh, yeah, we're going to pay for you to go over there. Don't worry. Have a Merry Christmas. At the end of their terms, they were to be redeemed. Hence, the term commonly applied to them, redemptioneers, redeem. The system was abusive enough, however, to incite public outrage, and several states passed laws to regulate it. As Louisiana did immediately after the case of the Mullers and their compatriots attracted journalistic attention. Such action came too late, though, to help the Mullers despite protests by immigrants and their defenders in New Orleans, and even a court inquiry which should have shown clearly that they were being swindled yet again. Some of these unluckier passengers, among them, found themselves indentured, the Mueller family included, less than a month after their first sight of America at the Belize, the Mullers were journeying upriver to either the Atacapas region, the southern south central portion of the state known for cattle racing or nearby opelousas their services apparently haven't been purchased by a farmer their services they were indentured servants their slaves impossible though it seems even further tragedy awaited the mullers daniel miller died on the trip reports identity the cause of his death variously as drowning fever or apoplexy what his young son jacob fell overboard and drowned accidents were not uncommon for boat travelers at that time according to a historian donald j millet rivers and bayou's Deville, boat captains by the existence of snags, log jams, and falling and overhanging trees that were a constant menace to navigation. What became of the two little orphan girls was not known. Numerous friends and relatives searched for them, but they vanished without a trace until Madame Carl's shocking discovery of Sally a quarter century later. All right, so that was the whole backstory behind how this person ended up there and who she was. How did Sally, age four, when she was orphaned, become a slave? The answer is not known. Now they don't know. See, they're trying to pretend that European or white people wasn't slaves, just like the so-called Negro. They, they're trying to pretend on this article because they historically found somebody who was under this status. So how did she become a slave? The answer is not known. For at this time of her disappearance, while en route westward, she also disappears from the historical records. She reappears four years later listed on a deed of sale from slave trader Anthony Williams of Mobile, Alabama, to John Fitz Miller of New Orleans. Exactly how she came into Williams' possession is not clear, but it is possible to surmise. A young child orphan, speaking no English, indentured to a farmer in an isolated rural area of the state was easily exploited. 
all right they're letting you know so she says we don't know the answer is not known but she knows <laughs> it's logical right it's, you gotta be if you be historic and logical that's basically what you conclude that's the most logical thing that she was exploited continued exploited as an indentured servant and sold who would protect her rights the kidnapping of free black children into slavery was not uncommon apparently it could happen to whites as well apparently it can happen to german and european indentured servants yes as well sally miller spent most of her life in louisiana as the slave of john fitz miller from 1822 to 1838 miller worked for miller and his widowed mother sarah canby as the slave of john miller sally was known as sally miller but for reasons of clarity this writer has chosen to refer to her by her original name of Muller. John Fitz Miller was one of the New Orleans prominent citizens, a wealthy businessman. He started out in the lumber trade, establishing a sawmill in the city. As he prospered, Miller expanded his enterprises, adding a second sawmill, a sugar mill, and a rum distillery. He also acquired a good deal of land in the Atacapas region. Like Sally, he was not a native of New Orleans. Ironically, he came from Philadelphia, the city she and her family had been trying to reach. Never married, Miller lived with his mother in the Crescent City and later at several residences across the state, including one at New Iberia and one on what is today called Jefferson Island, where Miller helped found a resort and thoroughbred racetrack. Sally worked as a house servant, and if accounts of Miller's friends are to be believed, she, like his and his mother's other slaves, was not particularly ill-treated. While in Miller's service, she gave birth to three children. The first, Lafayette, born in 1825. And in 1838, Miller sold Muller to Louis Belmonte, who ran a cafe in Fogburn, Marigny. So she was being sold, right? Like property. She was sold. She's, she was being treated like a slave, this German person, right? Being sold. Now she's owned by this guy, Louis Belmonte, with a cafe. Close to Miller's New Orleans mill and residence, she had been working six years for her new owner when she filed her lawsuit. After being discovered by her long-lost German friends, Sally Miller sued Louis Belmonte and Joe John Fitz Miller in district court on the grounds that she was a free white woman and had been illegally held in slavery. Her case was argued by a team of lawyers, including Christian Roselius, considered one of the most brilliant attorneys in Louisiana's history. Roselius, at that time of the trial, had just finished serving as the state's attorney general. He was later a delegate of, to two state constitutional conventions and was professor and dean of the University of Louisiana, now Tulane University Law School. But he, like his client, had humble origins. Born in Bremen, Germany in 1803, Rosilius had come to New Orleans in 1819 as a redemptioner. So even this guy, who was wealthy and a lawyer and all that, he was an indentured servant slash slave too. So she went to court, right, to sue this John Miller. Now, in his defense, listen to what he says about her, all right? It says, in his defense, John Miller claimed that the plaintiff was not Sally Miller, but rather a mulatress slave. Mulatress, mulatto, mulatress. Oh, so she's not even that light-skinned, huh? So she looks like a mulatto, mulatress slave. So she's mixed. So I thought she was German. There was nowhere saying that she was mixed or her parents were mixed. Remember, her parents, both her parents were German. They came on the same chip. They weren't mixed. They were both described as German. There's nowhere saying that either one was this and the other, and the other one was black or, or African or anything like that. So both her parents were German, right? Same people. So why, is she, why was he saying she was a mulatto slave? Was she swarthy, a little dark skin? Was she a little dark skin? He said that she was known either as Bridget or Mary Bridget, whom he had acquired through legal means in 1822. He denied any knowledge of her prior to that time. Defense witnesses made assertions as to Miller's and his mother's good character and rebuted the prosecution statement. So if he was trying to make this up. Like, nope, I got her legally, whatever. But um, eventually she won the court case again. Now continuing, listen to this. Several witnesses attested to the plaintiff's appearance being in accord with that of a non-white person. A non-white person. She wasn't white fully. You hear what they're saying? People who had known her 
when she worked for Miller assumed that she was a mixed race, colored or quadroon, a colored person, colored, colored person. She's a colored, she's a German. Both her parents are German. They all thought she was colored a mixed race or a quadroon or a person of color mixed with something. She wasn't white pale skin. She was swarthy a little bit. All right. This is what I've been trying to tell you in this whole article. And I didn't know this about her. I hadn't read this whole article fully until I started recording this. And now I'm reading it with you because I, I just the first couple of pages was good. So I knew the whole thing was going to be good. And now, you know, what I was saying is that she could have been colored. You know, we're, we're assuming she's white uh, just because she's German and both her parents are German. But now we know there's even word of her in these court cases. There's sources for this. Her being called colored. We thought she was colored. Oh, we didn't know she was white. We thought she was colored. One added that he had seen slaves whiter than she. She's even, some of people said that they've seen other slaves even whiter than her. You hear that? So clearly these people were not shocked by the existence of slaves who physically looked to be white. It was apparently not a unique experience. Again, this is not a unique uh, case. It was thousands and thousands of, yes, white pale-skinned Europeans or light-skinned people, you know, colored people, anybody who can pass as a European or white that were also under indentured servitude so the article continues it basically sums up that it basically became about her being white or considered classified as a white person and she was german and not negro so that was the biggest question that if they admit that she was the person they say she was then they would have to admit that not only negroes were slaves or something like that or, or you know that she or that she didn't have that status of life should tell. She was an indentured servant. Eventually, sometimes she should have been freed and not been sold like, like property. 